think the most difficult thing about being a character in a Douglas Adams novel is not so much wondering what's going to happen next, as wondering if anything's going to happen next. You never really know if your character's going to develop into something really rather complex and interesting. Stop dead and never be mentioned again. Or just unexpectedly turn into a Coca-Cola vending machine. Plays havoc with your sense of motivation. How do you think I feel? One minute I'm there being pushed around all the time. Open entry bay number three, Marvin. Marvin, can you stay and fight off this gigantic battle machine? And then they run off and abandon me. Everything abandons me in the end. Even my body abandoned me, you know. Why do you think I'm sitting here in a moldy old raincoat? Every single bit of me fell off. Rather enthusiastically, I thought. What do you think they're talking about up there? Oh, the usual thing. I went to Cambridge. That was very interesting. I joined Footlights. That was very interesting. I left Cambridge. That was very interesting. They all lead exactly the same lives and say exactly the same things about it and then claim against all the available evidence that it's very interesting. You watch. I bet that's what he says. <laughs> You. Fort, how did you get here? I don't know. One moment, I'm hanging out in this bar on the other side of the Vaud Void of Quan, waiting to get a lift. And the next moment, I'm here. Where are we? I don't know. But we're definitely this side of the Vaud Void of Quan. That's horribly clear from the carpeting. But I wonder, mm -hmm. do you think we could get room service? But you'd have to be in a room, wouldn't you? Yeah. Let's be in, um... This one. Oh. Now where are we? I wish you'd stop saying where are we every ten seconds. Oh, I wish I could know where I am for more than ten seconds at a time. Well, why not just be where you are, you know, just be here. Hang out. Because if I don't know where here is, I can't be there properly, can I? But whatever's happening here is happening up there. How do you react to the suggestion sometimes made that Arthur is more pushed about than a character with his own life. He, he serves the plot. He's oh, he's absolutely a stereotype. I mean, I, I have to admit that. But I think, um, uh, in a way, he has to be, because he's the person to whom things happen. And they're, they're very much sort of... At, the characters, and he in particular, are very much in the, the service of the ideas rather than, thing, uh, rather than characters who sort of motivate themselves. And, um, in fact, I mean, the name Dent almost suggests that he's somebody to whom things happen. Do you ever get the strange, unaccountable feeling that you're a puppet on somebody else's strings, a pawn on somebody else's chessboard, a figment of somebody else's imagination? Ah, oh, so that's perfectly normal human paranoia. Everybody in the universe gets that. Yes, but suppose you actually found the somebody else. What are you talking about? This author chap was talking about a character in a story he'd written. Someone who gets lost in the galaxy and all sorts of terrible things happen to. Just a coincidence, you see. But... He said the character was a sort of a stereotype of a boring, ordinary person, so it couldn't have been, you know. Did he say what the character's name was? Yes. Arthur. Coincidence, you see, that's what misled me. Given that Ford knows everything and he comes from where he does, it must have given you some quite interesting problems. Well, to begin with, I find that sort of character absolutely infuriating. So that actually sort of drives me when writing it. I mean, it's the sort of person who always seems to know anything without ever betraying going through any kind of learning experience whatsoever. I find that infuriating because I suppose I'm somebody who always finds that life is a continual puzzle until you finally work it out. And so somebody who always seems to have, who have got there ahead of you without, without showing any marks in the snow. I just want to test a little notion of mine. Think of something completely at random. Say something nonsensical. Hmm? I mean deliberately nonsensical. Why? Just do it. Uh, the nasal membranes of the rhinoceros. Damn. They have uh, all their brain power stacked up behind their nasal membranes. And here we have a rhinoceros that does just that. Arthur, I think I know where we are. Are you going to tell me? Now, don't panic, but I don't think you're going to like it. I don't think you're going to like it one little bit.
revived? What the hell do you mean, revived? I'm a living person, not some fictional stereotype. But a fictional character would have to think he was a living person, or he wouldn't work as a fictional character. What? Look, there is an infinite number of infinitely variable universes, and we, us, have somehow wandered into one in which we are fictional characters. It's as if we've jumped sets. The set I of don't all want to know. Just shut up. Hello. And you can shut up can too, Marvin. What are you doing here? No, don't tell me. Just step aside. I have my own free will, and I'm prepared to assert it. Can you help me? How do you know that in asserting your free will, I you're not just it. doing exactly what was predetermined for Why you to do? Why don't you just both stand there arguing and <laughs> ignore me? Excuse me, am I in the right universe? I believe so. Well, but then... I believe anything. Go on, pick something. I'll believe it for you. Please don't feel you have to pretend you're glad to see me. Huh. Disguise. <laughs> Good idea. Oh, you didn't. Thanks, sources. Imminent economic recovery. <laughs> Only one previous owner. Virgin birth. What? Nice yellow dressing gown. Who are you? I am a fictional character who believes things. Who are you? <laughs> You can't help but try and follow an animal's thought processes, and you can't help when faced with an animal like a three-ton rhinoceros with nasal passages bigger than its brain, but fail. High on a rocky promontory sat an electric monk on a bored horse. Rubbish. What is this? Hmm. Dirk Gently's holistic detective agency. We solve the whole crime, we find the whole person. Missing cats and messy divorces are speciality. You're very strange, she said. You know, I'm very ordinary, said Arthur. But some very strange things have happened to me. You could say I'm more differed from than differing. Arthur Dent. It is me. Douglas Adams. He must be a biographer. I was so distressed to learn that Miss Tiddles has passed over. This is desperate news indeed. Excuse me. Is uh, Mr. Gently in? Maybe. Then again, he may not be. I'm not in a position to tell. It is not my business to know who's going about. Are you his secretary? I'm his ex secretary. I think I hear Miss Tiddles meowing in. No, she calls to you, Mrs. Bluthall. She says she's going to spend his money on stupid, expensive brass plates rather than pay me. Let him. I won't stand for it. She says she'll be even more at peace when you've paid some bill or other. Answering the phones properly if it's good for business. What's this fancy brass plate to do with that? Yes, I'm sure Miss Tiddles will appear, as I'm sure will your checkbook. Excuse me. I'd like to storm Still out, there. please. And good riddance. Yes. Yes, Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency. How can we be of help to you? Uh, yes, that's right, uh, Mrs. Sutherland. Um, messy divorces are actually a particular speciality of ours. Uh, yes, thank you, Mrs. Sutherland. Not quite that messy. Hello? Yes? Ah, uh, yes, Mrs. Rawlinson, I'm very glad you asked that. The term holistic refers to my conviction that uh, what we're dealing with here is the fundamental interconnectedness of all things. I see the solution to each problem as being detectable in the pattern and web of the whole. Let me give you an example. If you go to an acupuncturist with a toothache, he sticks a needle into your thigh. Do you know why he does that, Mrs. Rawlinson? No? Neither do I, Mrs. Rawlinson, but we intend to find out. And a pleasure talking to you, Mrs. Rawlinson. Goodbye. Ah, uh, Mrs. Soskind. Uh, good day to you, good day to you. Sadly, no news as yet of young Roderick, but the search is intensifying as we... Pre ah, yes. The bill. 
Mm, I was wondering if you'd received that. Uh, yes, but as I have endeavoured to explain to you over the seven years of our acquaintance, Mrs. Soskind, I incline to the quantum mechanical view in this matter. My theory is that your cat has not vanished, merely that his waveform has temporarily collapsed and must be restored. Schrodinger, Planck, and so on. Well, perhaps you could run over any areas of the bill that cause you difficulties. Uh, no, just, just, just the broader areas. Yes, expenses were expensive in the Bahamas, Mrs. Sorskind. It is in the nature of expenses to be so, hence the name. Uh, yes, well, I have plotted and triangulated the vectors of the interconnectedness of all things and located them on a beach in the Bahamas, which it is therefore necessary for me to visit from time to time in the... You sadden me, Mrs. Sorskind. Sadden me. I wish I could find it in my heart to say that I find your scepticism rewarding and invigorating, but I cannot. I'm drained by it, Mrs. Sorskin. Drained. I think you'll find an item to the bill to that effect. Let me have a look. Mm. Yes, here we are. Struggling on in the face of draining scepticism from client drinks. Um, £327.50. Yes. Yes, yes. My dear Mrs. Soskind, or, or may I call you Joyce? Yeah, very well. My dear Mrs. Soskind, let me say this. Do not worry yourself about this bill. Do not let it alarm or discomfort you. Do not, I beg you, let it become a source of anxiety to you. Just grit your teeth and pay it. And as always, a pleasure to speak with you, Mrs. Soskind. For now, goodbye, my dear Richard McDuff. Your pizza. Welcome, by the way, to my offices. The light works. Gravity works. Anything else we just have to take our chances with. Coming into your new book, Into Mostly Harmless. Yes, well, I think the puddle is... Is it a... anyway a starting point for it, or is it just, uh, it, does it just well, come into the story? It's... Put it, it comes into the story, but I think it's very much at the heart of, of what the book is about. It's the story of Arthur Dent's daughter. She is the daughter of, of an immigrant. Uh, living in a world where nobody's ever heard of the Earth, and Arthur banging on about it the whole time because it's so important to him. And she knows nothing whatsoever about this, but nevertheless, Earth as a home is the environment that made her what she is. So in the end, she gets driven to go back to Earth uh, and, and find where she came from and why. And um, so the story of the puddle and the way in which you get shaped by the environment into which you evolved, uh, although it's an only an incidental part of the story on the way, is actually, as far as I'm concerned, very much at the heart of it. Foolish! Look at this. Look at these. I know. These books are about me. This is my biography. Your biography? Yes, well, you get a mention in it here and there. Mm. Background fill. Otherwise, this is the story of my life. Arthur, this is fiction. What do you mean? It's as though you, we, us, real, living people, have somehow been dragged into a parallel universe in which we are fictional entities. Is that why? What? Well, when I went into the room, it was empty. But when I went out of it and looked through the window, those people were in there. Exactly. Well, what does it all mean? You've heard of length. Yes. Height. Yes. Width. Yes. Time. What about it? You know about quantum uncertainty. Something to do with cats. Normally, human beings perceive landscapes of space, successive slices of time, and only one slice of quantum uncertainty. Not about cats. Rhinoceroses perceive landscapes of time. Cats, I believe, perceive landscapes of quantum uncertainty. Do they, by Jove? Is that why they look at us so oddly? That is precisely why they look at us so oddly. Yeah. Does the term ZZ9 plural Z alpha mean anything to you? Should it? The galactic sector coordinates of Earth. Try and remember it. Hmm. Plural means it's on a kind of quantum fault line. All the possible Earths continually interfere with each other, which is why the place is full of cats and comedy writers. What? 
And why a writer in one possible Earth would actually be imagining events in another. You mean I decide to do something and he thinks he imagined it. Or he imagines something and then you do it. Or discover that it's already happened to you and... Well, try and remember that when you meet your daughter. I haven't got a daughter. You have now. I don't remember doing that. Oh. Come to think of it, now I do. Funny I never remembered it before. It seems to stop rather abruptly while I'm talking to Trillian, though. Oh, well. I expect the author got stuck for an idea. You know that writers always are just this bunch of whinging layabouts who have this fantasy that their characters should just somehow wander onto the page of their own volition? Are they? Believe me. All right. Well, now we have the technology to do that. What do you mean? I'll show you. I've rigged the computer. Getting stuck? I said, are you getting stuck? I just thought I'd help out. So, Trillian says, come on, write this down. Trillian says, are you sure you didn't dream the whole thing? Then I say, oh, remember those quote marks. You lie. I say, It's okay. He's got going again. We're free to go. No, 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 no. Let's party. I mean, the typical dream I have involves sitting at the kitchen table, going through all my accounts, and then watching the television. And then I wake up and have to discover I'm living on an alien planet. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? I mean, how does your life strike you? I believe for every drop of rain that falls, a flower grows. I believe that somewhere in 